and welcome to our Conscious Leader Circle, where we meet once a month to support each other through these changing and epic times to help you feel more grounded, energized, and focused, or as I like to say, centered, connected, and conscious. And we mm -hmm. have a very, very special episode today uh, that happens to be focusing on our love of animals. And uh, we have two announcements to, to start with. Um, first, our wonderful guest speaker, Dawn Phoenix, is going to be talking about how you can connect with the heart and soul of animals. And it's going to be a really phenomenal conversation. And Dawn also um, has a course uh, starting on August 30th, an online course called Intuitive Interspecies Communication Essentials designed to deepen your connection with the animals in your life. So this is gonna be so exciting uh, to hear about that because for all of us here, I'm sure we have already been communicating with our animals. Um, and it's something that I, I would love to learn more how to refine that, or if you're a beginner, uh, just how to get started doing that. Um, and then the other uh, announcement for today is my new multi-author book, Evolving on Purpose, co-creating with the divine with my chapter the divinity of horses launching on amazon on august 30th and one of my wonderful co-authors susanna kurtz is here hi savannah um and uh and we hope that um you can all join us for the book launch event um on august 30th we're going to be having some wonderful prizes for people who join us um, including my new ebook, Seven Steps to Co-Create with the Divine. So we're all in alignment here uh, with Dawn's theme. Um, and August 30th, Richard, must be a powerful day for sharing sharing our gifts with the world um, and uh, and uh, and supporting and supporting others because the book launch and Dawn's course is August 30th. Is that right, Dawn? It starts August 30th. It does. And actually, I'm sure Richard, if he's into astrology and things like that, will let us know that that's actually a blue moon, the 30th. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sun and Virgo, moon of Pisces. Yeah. Richard is not just into astrology. Richard is the master of astrology. So if anybody ever wants <laughs> one of the great masters, a phenomenal uh, a reading with Richard, it's more than just astrology. It's it's um, it's insight that will um, help guide you forever. And Richard can share more with us about that. But Richard's been my one of my spiritual guides on earth for the last 40 years. So wow. pretty phenomenal. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. Um, and welcome Dawn. And Dawn Phoenix um, is, an in, is an intuitive interspecies communicator and she'll be discussing breaking barriers, speaking the language of nature to create a more sustainable future. Wow, is that perfect? I mean, I can't imagine a more perfect <laughs> title and um, and summary of, of how it's all integrated. So if you love animals, and if you'd like to connect with their heart and soul, then you're in the right place. Don will be sharing how to empower yourself to tune into your animal companion's well-being. So everyone, this is an interactive gathering. So be sure to ask Dawn your questions and contribute your stories. Um, always be mindful, we have an hour. So, but um, I encourage you to share. <laughs> um, and Dawn has crafted this life-changing course, Intuitive Interspecies Communication Essentials. It's designed to deepen your connection with the animals in your life. Imagine being able to communicate telepathically with animals understand their needs, emotions, and desires, and say goodbye to guesswork when they're sick, injured, lost, or experiencing behavior issues. With Dawn's expert guidance, you'll gain the confidence and skills to create a harmonious and loving bond with your animal companions. Now in the chat, I've put the link where you can learn more about Dawn's course and, and to register. And I also have the link for our book launch event um, on August 30th. So Dawn, uh, take it away. This is so exciting. Oh, thank you so much, Lydia. And I'm so glad to be here. I'm very excited. And I just love you and the work you're doing. And I'm so honored to be here today. Um, 
So gosh, where to start? I think probably might be to talk about some misconceptions about around animal communication. So one of the things is we're changing the name actually. It, animal communication is now becoming intuitive interspecies communication. And we're changing the name because we're evolving as a species. And I know it doesn't always look like that. You know, if you look at the entire world, but when we look within and we see ourselves, you know, we know that we are. And we not only have the ability, the natural born ability to communicate with animals telepathically, but we have that ability to communicate with every being who we share this planet with. So the rocks, mother earth, the water, the sky, the plants and trees around us. So we're actually broadening the animal communicator community uh, is broadening the definition and updating our terminology so that it helps us to understand our greatness and our capacity for greatness to not only communicate with animals, but also other beings, which I think is so exciting. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Dawn. That's so beautiful and so well said because many of us have always felt the elements, you know, the elementals. Um, and there's an area on my property called Fairy Grove, and and I know fairies are there. Um, I can't I can't show anybody the fairies, <laughs> but uh, but you can feel you can feel the elements, you know. And I've always loved the elemental connection and communication, and of course we are part of that, and so are the animals. Exactly, exactly. And once we understand that, you know, we're all like you just said, we're all interconnected, we're all one, we're all part of this beautiful web of source energy, then it makes it that much easier to be able to communicate with them. And so just a few examples of ways that we're using animal communication in real world applications. So not only at home with our own animal community or our own animal companions, but out in the world. So for instance, rehabilitation and conservation. If there is like, it's kind of like a land bridge, you know, that they might build over a highway for animals to cross safely so that they don't get hit by the cars. So they'll do that. And it's covered, you know, by dirt and it looks like the land around it, but it's a man-made structure. And usually it goes over, sometimes it goes under, it depends, but it's meant to keep animals safe. So one thing that animal communicators or, you know, IIC, you know, intuitive interspecies communicators, we use IIC a lot too, to just shorten it since it's a mouthful. What we can step in and help with is when those bridges are constructed, and they've been around a little while. If there are animals, they're noticing animals aren't using them because they can put cameras up, you know, so they can witness and see and track who's using it, who's not. We can step in and say, okay, animals in the area, you know, please, you need to use this bridge because it can help save your life. And here's why. And here's how. And we can explain that. We can show pictures to them because telepathy is more than just words. It's actually not words at all. It's emotions and visual, you know, either videos or snapshots, um, senses, you know, sights, smells, tastes, sounds, memories. All of that is encompassed in telepathic communication. So we can send information to them and also maybe ask why. It's always a two-way communication. Telepathy is always two-way. So we'll ask, is there a reason you're not using this? Is there something that needs to be done so that you do use this so that you can be safe? And so we tap in and ask, you know, if there's anything they need and to let them know that it's important and how life-saving it can be. So that's one way that we can use animal communication. Also, when there's a human-animal conflict, because let's face it, you know, they were here first and we've trampled on a lot of their territory, which we claim is ours. So one big example of this is the orcas of the Straits of Gibraltar. And they have been ramming, as people have been saying, boats, and they're calling them attacks. And I call them encounters. And 
they've been dismantling boats. They haven't been eating anybody or hurting humans. That's not what they do. But they have been trying to get their message across to these sailboats who are coming into, and it's also larger ships, but they can't really do anything to a larger ship. So they're targeting the smaller ones where they can actually have their message heard. These sailboats are coming into their, their home where they live and where they have their young families and they're being injured. And some of them, their lives have been shortened and they've been crippled. And if you're an apex predator, the way that orcas are, you need your full physicality, you know, in tip top shape to be able to survive and for your pod to be able to survive. And so this has been going on for years, over 10 years, where these orcas have been encountering large, small boats who have been injuring them and they have had enough and they are letting us know we need you to change your behaviors, change your routes and hear our message. And so they're dismantling our boats to get our attention. And so what we have done as communicators, there are a number of us who have just tapped in and said, what would you like us to know? What do you need us to know so that these encounters stop, you get what you need and we can understand how we can coexist harmoniously, which I actually tapped into and wrote about in my newsletter um, about a month ago. So um, it was fascinating. And they just need their message to be heard that they're in danger and they need to start practicing self-preservation but not to be threatening to us. That's not their, their goal. They just need to let us know that they're in danger because they trust us enough to be heart-centered enough to work out amongst ourselves and with them safer, better ways to be in that area. Well, thank you, Dawn. And I loved that message in your email as well. Um, so anyone who wants to sign up for Dawn's free newsletter, um, it's just rich with this type of um, content and really helps expand your um, awareness and understanding and 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 connection. Um, I love, absolutely love Dawn's newsletters. So um, feel free to sign up for her newsletters. And and you also do. Um, you've also I met you through the star star horses. Is that star horses? And what are the dolphins? That you call the dolphins? Just, they're the dolphins. There's the star horses of Kerala, and then there's the dolphins. <laughs> Can you briefly speak to them about them? Because you have beautiful um, uh, workbooks and cards, that sort of thing as well, that I, I'm interested in speaking with you about uh, when I get to my next level of equine healing retreats of offering them as part of my equine healing retreat. So the star horses of Kerala, let, like what are, who are they and what are their messages? Okay, so the star horses of Kerala are actually physical horses here on the planet, as well as beings in spirit. And it's the same with the dolphins. And I was working in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is a little sandbar that kicks out <laughs> off the coast of North Carolina here in the US. And they live on the beaches and in the sand dunes in the area behind the sand dunes. And that's, they're wild and they're protected. There is a fine if you get less than 50 feet from them, but unfortunately things still happen um, between people and, and the horses. So there are tour companies that go out in vehicles and take people because you can drive on the beach out there. They take people out to view the horses. You can't touch them, that's illegal, but they're protected, like I said, but you can go out in these vehicles or your own on the beach and just view them. And I was working for this, this company called Wild Horse Adventure Tours. And apparently the horses brought me there so that I could be there and receive their messages. So I worked there in the office. I was not a tour guide, but I still connected with their energy and it was just amazing. So one day I was, I sat down and I said, okay, I'd like to tune in to the horses and just see, you know, where did you come from? I wanted to know their origin story because one of the number one questions we get when I was working there from our, you know, our visitors to the area was where did they come from? And pretty much everybody was like, we don't really know. We think that maybe because they have Spanish Mustang blood in them, 
that they were traveling on Spanish galleons that sunk and then they swam to the beaches, but we're really not sure. So I said, okay, all right, I'm going to figure this out. I'm like, I'm an animal communicator. I can do this. <laughs> so I tapped in and I talked to Jocko, who was their spokes horse. And he said that they actually came from the stars and that they came here for a purpose very similar to the dolphins to guide humanity into our awakening process and to become the best versions of ourselves that we're meant to be. And so I wrote a book based on that conversation. I talked with him for an hour and a half and which was invigorating and also exhausting <laughs> when you're channeling that long. And so I, I looked at those five or six pages of notes and I said, I need to do something about this. So I wrote a children's book because I figured putting it out to children and in that kind of a format would be a really easy way to get the information out and also to reach our future leaders who are going to be you know, the stewards of the planet once we hand it off to them. And so they really wanted to talk, talk with the children. And I checked with them about that. And so we co-created the Star Horses of Kerala, which was my original book. And after that, I made a coloring book for younger kids who maybe can't read. Maybe if their siblings were reading it to them or their parents, they could, you know, color. And then I was like, okay, how about the kids who are older, middle school, high school, even adults? We made a journal. So the Star Horses and I created a 52-week guided journal with prompts uh, for people to, you know, write in. And it's about tapping into self-love and self-reflection. And it's they're guiding you even more along that process of remembering who you are, your power, how to tap into compassion, things like that. And then um, I have a friend, Regina Curtis, who is a soul wisdom coach, mentor, and also an intuitive artist. And we've worked together on other projects. And I said, what would you feel about making an, a coloring book for adults? And so we created the meditation mandalas, messages from the star horses. I channeled the messages and then I sent them to her and she created mandalas for each particular message that centers around a theme. And so that's our newest addition to the star horse series library, if you will. Um, so they're just here to help guide us, just like the dolphins. The dolphins are here to help guide us and become our highest version of ourselves and to tap into the love that we are. And I include them together when I do projects or talk, as in my um, printable oracle deck. The dolphins and the star horses both wanted to be involved in that process, and that's giving messages to everybody without having to go out and spend a lot of money on a, a deck, you know, the, in the store. You just print it yourself at home, and um, they wanted to be together because they're best friends. Before the star horses became embodied in physical form, they were on the land. They lived in the ocean. That's where they first came, and they talked about that as the ocean being Mother Gaia's womb for them and letting them have that between phase from coming from the stars and in the non-physical into the ocean, into a physical body, but not yet the kind of their, that they're on land. And while they were there, the dolphins became their best friends because the dolphins were already here on the planet. And then mankind was evolving and they were waiting for mankind to evolve until man was ready to interact with them, both the dolphins and the star horses. And then when mankind was ready, they came up onto the shores and became the horses that we see now. But that's part of the reason that the star horses wanted to live on the beaches where they are so that they could interact with humans. And also they could still be near their best friends, the dolphins. Magnificent. <laughs> it's absolutely magnificent. And we can see they are divine beings mm -hmm. and humans have so much help. You know, we have so much help to support us on a functional level um, and to connect with our spirit and to heal, grow, and evolve. And I'm so excited. So first of all, Dawn, how can people um, purchase um, some of these products that you have for sale? Okay, well, the books, they're all on my website. So you can find them on Amazon, but they're more affordable on my website. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the whole Amazon thing. I'm much more about like, we should be in control of our own 
things that we do. So our products and services. So they're on my website. You can just go to dawnphoenix.org and then a slash shop. Or if you just go to my dawnphoenix.org, there's just a toggle button up at the top in the menu that brings you to the shop. And I have, you can buy one book at a time or I've packaged them where you can buy two, three, four, all of them, whatever. So there's all kinds of variations. The Oracle card deck, that's free. It's a PDF. So you can just drop me an email and say, hey, I'd like that at um, dawn at dawnphoenix.org and I will totally shoot it over to you. Um, I use it as a giveaway, you know, for when I'm doing different events. So I don't have it on my website right now, but it'll eventually get up there. But it's free. You don't have to buy that at all. And um, right now, if you wanted to get on my newsletter and sometimes I'll pop out some freebies like music I'm working on or I'll bring up the PDF again, the cards, um, there's just on my website five misconceptions about interspecies communication. If you just click on that and just say, hey, yeah, I'd like to, you know, get this PDF, you'll learn the information that's in there and the misconceptions. And I haven't gone over all of them. So you'll still learn something new. And then that automatically brings you into my newsletter. So, so what is the number one misconception? If there is one or the top, the top three. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I'm sitting there going, how do I do this? Okay. So the top three, I, I would say the number one is that, oh, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's only relegated to a special few people. I can't do that. I don't have that ability. And that is 100% incorrect because we are all born with that ability. It's our birthright. We just forgot that we had it. So I say I teach a course. I teach the course, but I don't teach you. What I'm doing is helping you to restore your ability. You have it already. I'm just helping you remember that you have it and then giving you practical ways that you can actually use it in your life with your own animal companions so that you can practice. So that's the number one misconception. And I think the other number two is that telepathy isn't real. A lot of people are saying, oh, if it's, I can't touch it. It's not tangible. There aren't, there's not proof. It doesn't exist. You know, I'll believe it when I see it kind of a thing. And that's actually not true at all. And there are a number of ways that we can prove that it does exist. And I go over this in the course. So I say, there, these are ways that you can say to yourself, am I checking off this list when I have a communication session with an animal? Uh-huh. Okay. This, I've met that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've met that one. I've met that one. And that helps to help you trust the process until you intuitively know that it is actually happening. So we have a process where we can check off, you know, certain criteria. So those are probably the two top misconceptions. And I think probably the third one is that animals are dumb and that they can't communicate. They All they want is food or belly rubs and there are babies and our children and they don't have souls or consciousness of their own. And that breaks my heart actually to hear because our animals, conscious beings, <laughs> they have their own agendas. They have their own soul purposes and missions, just like we do. And they have their own healing journeys to go through. They are our teachers. They are our healers. And they are some of our most important guides to our, to and through our ascension process on this planet. And without them, we would be so lost and a lot of us don't even know it. Not anybody here though. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone's interested in, in um, getting started communicating with their cat or their dog or their pet or their horse, uh, what do you suggest as some simple um, first steps? You kind of alluded to it just now, but what would you, someone who's kind of new or who wants to refine, I think a lot of us here, um, have a spiritual relationship with their animals, but we can still learn and refine that. Um, and then we can talk about the elements after. Sure. So the first thing to do, you always, always, when you are, and you can probably speak to this, being around horses who are so super sensitive to our energies, you need to be a clear and open conduit to receive information and also to send it. Because if you, if you think about, you know, a sewer line or a pipe, water can't flow 
in either direction if it's clogged. And we carry a lot of stuff. Even if we work on ourselves all the time, it's very, very important to be a clear and open channel. So one of the first things I teach, and this is the one of the easiest ways to be able to just be open to any kind of communication, even if it's a look that you get from your, your cat and you're like, oh, that look means that you would like me to change the litter box. I see, you know, you'll just get that drop in if you clear your clear yourself. So doing grounding, and for those of you who don't know what grounding is, that's where you connect yourself down into Mother Earth, and it helps you to stay connected to the now moment. It's a really important necessary uh, quality to have, to be in the now moment. You're not worrying about the, the future. You're not thinking about a conversation you had five minutes ago. You're just here right now. And so a simple way to do that is to close your eyes and literally just take a couple deep breaths. That's the easiest way and you can do it anywhere. So once you just take a couple deep breaths, that helps to calm our overactive nervous system and physically bring us into the now. The breath is one of the most magical tools we have in our huge Batman tool belt <laughs> that we wear and may not be aware of. So just to slow your breath, and just be here present now. And then if you wanna get a little more fancy, you can connect into Mother Earth by dropping a cord. If you think about it from the base of your spine or your feet, it could be a cord. It could be of any color you want. It could be a cord of light. You could drop vines or branches from the bottom base of your spine or from the bottom of your feet down into Mother Earth. And you just imagine that they're going through all the layers of Mother Earth. And then when they get to her core, there is a crystal there or a ball of light, but an energy, a very high vibrational energy that's held within the heart of our Mother Earth. And she helps us to be present and to be clear in this moment. And so if you imagine that that cord or those roots or the vines are just gently connecting with that crystal or that ball of light or whatever it is that you see inside Mother Earth, then you'll feel whatever you feel or see whatever you see, you have an experience. And then imagine that she's sending you loving golden or green, whatever color it is, light back up through the roots or the cord up into your body. And just imagine that that light is coming up through your feet and then your knees and your thighs and your hips, your belly, your chest and your heart space, your shoulders, your neck, your jaw, your eyes and the top of your head. And you're fully grounded into the energy of Mother Earth and she is holding you in her, her sacred embrace. And that keeps you in that beautiful, high vibrational energy. And animals respond to that very well because they recognize that. That's part of who they are too. And so when you're kind of in that high vibe, they'll respond much, much better. And you will have your pipes cleared <laughs> and you'll be able to receive information much more easily. And then after you've done that, if you really want to try to say, I would like to understand you better if someone is with their cat, just sit and you don't even have to be in the same room as them. It actually works better if you're not because you're not distracted by what they're doing. So it's actually better to not be there with them if you can help it. And if you can't, it's fine. But this kind of gives you a bit of distance and separation so you can actually tune into what you're receiving and not what's going on around you. So just send them love. Send them love from your heart space. It's not about thinking. Telepathy takes place in the heart space. And that's why you have to be that clear conduit because you need that clarity in your heart to receive and to send information. Just send them love. And imagine that there's this beautiful beam of light going from your heart into their heart space. And just imagine sending that love and just kind of be with that and, you know, 
be with how that feels, and then ask if they would be willing to send love back to your heart space. So you're practicing sending and receiving already without getting specific information because you need to build your confidence up to do that and just sit and feel how it is to be connected, to be sending, but then receiving that love, that direct love from their heart space. And anything that comes with it that you get will be perfect for you. Wow. We could just do a whole masterclass, a whole retreat on this. <laughs> this is phenomenal. So it's, it's um, 11.40. So what I suggest is, do you mind walking us through the um, the key modules in your course? Because I did want to ask you about um, one of them, but I don't want to spend the whole session on it. Mm -hmm. So um, if you could highlight the course and then we'll open it up uh for people to ask you questions or share their experiences um how does that sound yeah that sounds good so if it looks like i'm looking at my computer for a moment it's because i am i am just bringing up the um basically the syllabus you know for it and that way i'm not sitting there going um uh uh <laughs> and trying to remember so it's a six week course it's live i will be with you each week at 2 p.m starting uh, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, starting on Wednesday, uh, August 30th. And so it'll be through Zoom. And each week we'll meet at 2 p.m. on that Wednesday of that week. And the first module, we actually go through quieting the mind and grounding yourself. So we understand, I teach what animal communication is and what it isn't. Basically, you know, what our limitations are, you know, like we're not veterinarians, things like that. We go over that. We go over ways that we can use animal communication. And I'm talking about animal communication right now specifically, instead of saying interspecies intuitive community or intuitive interspecies communication, because we're specifically talking about animals right now, um, the, the roles that we have in everyday life. And then we go through creating a grounding practice, like what I just went through here, uh, we do that. And then you can also create your own, you know, after the class, if this is not something that resonated for you. And then we, we clear the mind. So we do grounding practice and clear the mind. And so that was one of the things that when I was doing the market research, people wanted to know was how do I quiet my monkey mind? So that's the first thing we work on the first week. Uh, the second week we work on ethics and the process of gathering preliminary information before you tune into an animal if they're not yours, because people will ask you to do this if they don't already, if you you know do something like this, um, they'll ask you to help with their animal. And then I walk you through the protocol for tuning in to an animal because there are certain steps that you need to follow in order to have a successful session. So we do that and then we, Week three, we discover ways that you specifically receive information because we receive through all of our senses. And so we go through a meditation, I call it the garden of the five senses that I created. And we go through that and you experience different ways of receiving information in that meditation so that when you are communicating with an animal, you actually can receive in various ways. Um, and we practice communicating with animals in that class, we'll always practice together. So you get feedback from me because we share after and have questions and we talk about the experiences. So you're not doing this alone. And that's when we really start, you know, putting where the rubber meets the road. And we start actually communicating with the animals now that we have our foundation. And then in week four, we talk about communicating with lost animals and how you can communicate with your animals should they become separated from you in case of a wildfire or, you know, a house fire, if they're out walking and they become separated from you, how you can have communication with them to find out where they are so that they can return home. And we, in week five, we address anxiety and behavior issues because animals behavior always makes sense to them, even if it doesn't make sense to us. So we talk about that and how to address those with compassion and diplomacy. And then in week six, we talk about uncovering an animal's history because oftentimes when animals come to us, we are not their first people. And even if we are their first people, 
they have, they have past lives just like we do. And so they can have traumas or issues that they carry through with them. So if they're having a particular health issue or a behavior issue, oftentimes it's really important to be able to discover an animal's history. And I learned this when I was working at the Humane Society uh, in Verde Valley in Arizona. So, and also during that last week, Karen Fullerton, who is, she works with animal energetics. She is gonna come in during that class and talk about animal energetics and uh, actually teach us how to do an energetic clearing for our animals. So that's gonna be super exciting. Wow, what a phenomenal course. That's like such a beautiful gift that you're giving us. And the beginning part, I mean, all of it, but the beginning part really um is cultivation of self right so everything that you're teaching in the in the first three modules um as a foundation is something we have for ourselves at all times and we're all channels of energy um and to be able to cultivate that and become comfortable with that is a gift we give ourselves for the rest of our lives i mean it is really phenomenal uh so does anybody have any questions um anything they want to discuss with dawn about her course about what she's shared so far it's just the tip of the iceberg i mean we can we're gonna have to do like a whole series or something on <laughs> game i have so much to share like i have so much to say it's amazing it's amazing we're we're so in alignment it's you know mm -hmm. i have to stop myself from you know engaging so <laughs> anybody let's start with our phone friends uh, Teresa, is there anything that you wanted to share or ask Dawn? Yes, I thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Dawn. Um, my question is this, and you kind of touched upon it very lightly, Dawn. Look, I have uh, a kitty right now who I really feel he's like the soul and spirit of a previous kitty that I had. My other kitty, who passed away at the age of about 21, it was almost like a child. And I told myself after that, I, you know, it's so hard and difficult losing a kitty uh, because it was just not a kitty. It's part of my being. And then unexpectedly, as I walked into a pet value store to say hi to all the animals, as I normally do, they had an adoption week. And Lord and behold, there was a beautiful little kitty. He looked at me. I looked at him. He stood up. He did the kitty cat stretch. I walked to him and he started kind of um, just rubbing himself against the glass. And I says, oh, my God, I got to hold him. So I held him and he purred very loudly into my arms. And I says, oh. Okay, I'm taking you home. And I just feel at all levels, especially when I look into his eyes, that there is an inner soul and spirit connection. Is it common for um, our pets to reincarnate over and over uh, into our lives? It is, it is. When we have a very close and special connection to them, if they're part of our soul group, that can absolutely happen. So it is very possible. Just like humans, animals can incarnate. And actually, not only can they incarnate back into our lives as you know, a previous form of themselves or a form of their previous selves. So your your kitty reincarnated with you as another kitty, but they can come to us as other species and also humans. I actually had a past life where I was a war horse. I just got told this two weeks ago in a reading. It was amazing. And I said, oh, that explains a lot <laughs> about my stubbornness and things. And so they can have been in our lives as children or family members or friends in human form. And we can have been animals also in other past lives. So we can interact with them and they can incarnate with us in so many different and various ways. It's just beautiful. And so you and this kitty soul must be soul family for you to look and feel, first of all, you know, and recognize that energy as it feels like home and feels like love and feels familiar. And then to look into their eyes and to see that. And it's true. They say the eyes are the window to the soul and they really are. So I absolutely believe that, yes, that is possible and it happens frequently. And just to piggyback off that, when we do lose 
you know, our animal companions, this is something a lot of people come to me because I'm also what's called an animal death doula, where I help them off the planet. They don't need the help, but it's to connect with them for their people and help their needs get met when they're on, you know, in their, their end of life process. And also after they've transitioned to communicate with them on behalf of their people so that their people can know that they're okay on the other side. One of the things that we can do, and I need to teach a course on this coming up, um, is to ask them either while they're still here on the planet or after they've transitioned, we can ask them to come back to us. So we can make that request. They may or may not My dog, Sweetie, who she's the reason I became an animal communicator when I lost her because it broke my heart so deeply and I wanted to get in touch with her. She does not want to come back to the earth because she had such a sick life. She was so unhealthy. She's like, now I'm good. And I said, okay, I understand that. But my current animal companion, Tutu, Manitou, she has agreed to come back to me when it's a good time for us. And so you can absolutely do that when this kitty, you know, crosses over, you can ask, would you please come back to me again, if that's something you would like, but you have to be specific. My animal communication instructor, when I was learning animal communication, did not specify when she asked her dog to come back to her and her dog came back to her as a cat and her husband doesn't like cats. So it was a very close call (laughs) that they almost didn't uh, adopt that kitty. Um, but she knew that that was her, her dog. So I hope that answers your question, Teresa. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much, Dawn. Sure. My pleasure. Well, it's been really an incredible time on the earth when we're awakening to our multidimensional selves and everything that Dawn just shared, um, is part of our evolution and expanding our awareness of the infinite life uh, that that we are. And we have our, um, you know, our uh, definition, you know, of who we are in this life, but we're multidimensional beings at all times and through our lifetime journeys. And that was just a beautiful sharing, Dawn, about that. Martin, Martin, you have the floor. Yes. Uh... It's not really a question, but it's a horse story. So a couple of years ago, a rider and a horse came by and on the trail into my place. And I said, hey, what are you you doing? Uh, This is my place, not your place. You know, okay. And they went away. And then, I, you know, I was being like the horse police. So I I went I went outside and I could feel the energy of the horse. No, I could feel something. And I spotted them about 200 feet away through all this brush. I could sense them. But I couldn't see them. I could sense them. So to me that was like uh, I didn't tap in, uh, you know, my, the energy of my, my land is pretty, pretty crazy. It's, you know, like mm-hmm. a pyramid, but has that ever happened where you don't even can't see the horse? You can actually feel them far away. Well, you don't even. Okay. We have feedback. Maybe, Maybe Martin, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, when it's like I said, when you're not in the same room as the animal that you're communicating with, it's actually more powerful because you can actually tune into that energy. And so your land is a conduit. And so that physical interaction you had, you probably didn't even notice, you know, the energy because you were right there in the physical interacting with what was in front of you right there. But then when they were away and you couldn't see them, then you were able to tap into the non-physical, which oftentimes is more powerful. So when I, I offer animal communication sessions to people, so not only do I teach it, but I'm a practitioner and I work virtually online and all I need is a photograph of the animal and that's it. So, I mean, their name and other information and we go over what to gather, but I'm not there physically with the animal ever very rarely. And even when I tap into my own dog, you know, my animal companion, I try not to be in the same room as her because I'm distracted by her presence in the physical when we're together. So yes, that's absolutely 
exactly how it works actually. And with your land being that conduit, like when you said pyramid, before you said pyramid, I heard conduit come in, your, your land is definitely a conduit. So it would actually be really interesting for you to tap into the other energies around you and just see, you know, who else you can feel the energies for the, the plants, the animals, you know, the trees, um, the land, everything. That's awesome. Um, and yeah. Dawn had her hand up just so before we move on uh, to someone else, I saw Dawn kind of lift her hand up earlier and um, I didn't know if she had a question or not. So I just wanted to let you know, but Martin, that's actually a really super cool story. And you're proving, you know, we're born with this ability. No one taught you to do that. You just did it on your own. So go you. Thanks. Well, this is a beautiful illustration too of, of how we're evolving in, in the awareness that we're one energy field. Mm -hmm. and uh, sharing energy, what we call long distance, um, is just as effective. And some some of my clients with the long distance Reiki prefer now the long distance because, again, there's no distractions either of the person receiving um, or the person sending, whether it's animal communication or specifically something like Reiki. Uh, Hands-on is great and being in person is great as well, but we're just uh integrating we're expanding right all who we are evolving in the beautiful oneness of the energy of the universe oh, i just love that um i know joanne has her hand up so we're we'll get to joanne if anybody wants to stay after 12 i'm willing to stay longer i usually hang out for an hour um and um joyce has her hand up and uh, so if you do have to leave at 12, just wave and thank you for joining us. The links um, are in the chat and feel free to get in touch with Dawn through her website as well. So who's up next? Um, who's, I can't see, I'd have to go into view to see everybody now, okay. <laughs> um, Dawn, was Dawn? Dawn's next, okay. <laughs> yeah. My question is, how do you communicate with animals that have been rescued from other countries? So my son rescued a dog from Egypt. And obviously the, the commandments or the communication with a dog prior to coming here would be in Egyptian. So how do you communicate with other animals? My daughter rescued some from Mexico, so she learned they were Spanish speaking. Does language have a bearing on your communication? Okay, that's a really super great question. And it does not because so little of our communication when we're communicating telepathically is words. So animals communicate through emotion, which is, okay, we have feedback again. Um, Don, maybe try I'm muting yourself. Mute. I'm gonna mute as well. So let's all mute. Okay, when cool. someone... sorry about that, yay tech. So um, yeah, when we're communicating telepathically that takes place in the heart. And so it's not in the mind. And so words play very little part in what we receive. And I'll go into that some more. So we receive through emotion, pictures, and then senses, things that taste. If a horse is tasting water that tastes metallic and that's why they're not drinking water, you might taste something metallic on your tongue. With a dog from another country, you're still gonna get the information that you need to get in the way that you receive. So even if that dog is speaking another language, when you get that information, if it's coming in the form of words, if that's how you're receiving it, you'll get it in English. Because if you think about it, animals don't even speak human, they're animals. <laughs> they don't actually like speak it, you know? So it's how we receive. So they'll send through the ways that they send, through emotion or senses, movies, pictures, sensations in the body, how it feels to be them, a particular spot if they're sore, through their point of view if they're looking at something. And none of that has to do with spoken language. So that's actually the beauty of telepathy is that it, it transcends spoken language. And spoken language is such a hindrance because we have language barriers, where in telepathy, there are no language barriers. And um, I had, I'll just real quick go into this. I had a client who I've worked with her and one of her horses before, and she is adopting a horse from another country for her daughter, who the horse actually had to travel on a plane to come here and he's here now. And when I communicated with him, he 
only, you know, he was only living in that country, which they don't speak English. I believe it was somewhere in uh, somewhere near Germany. And it never even occurred to me that there would be a problem because I know when I receive information, it's going to come to the heart space and it's going to come the way that I understand it in the ways that I receive. And it was beautiful. And there was, it was just like talking to an animal here, you know, in my own country here in the US. So there's never any language barriers at all because tele, you know, telepathy transcends spoken language. That's a really good question, Don. Um, I might have to like address that <laughs> some more in my course or, or, you know, through a workshop. That's really wonderful. I could write that down. <laughs> You know, thank you for that. And um, I think it's something that we've all thought of. And we have we have examples of that in our lives. Um, so Joanne, Joanne is up is up next for your question. Is Joanne still with us? No, I don't think Joanne. Oh, Joanne, there. There you are, Joy. Are you still? She's waiting, maybe. Well, she's muted. She might be talking, but she's muted. Oh, we can't see her. Yeah. Joanne, I think maybe she stepped away. Her screen is on. Okay, we, we can come back to Joanne. And then uh, Joyce, I think, is next. So I will mute while we are speaking to minimize the back. Everybody. Well, I want to thank you, Dawn. That was just so awesome. You touched on so many things. And when you talked about the clearing and come with a clean, come clear with your mind and not thinking of everything. My animals are so much like that. My horses are always just leave the agendas away and just come with an open mind and come clear. So I love that. And then a question on one of my horses. I've had him for almost 10 years now. And he had a lot of previous owners and a lot of hard, rough handlers on him. He still holds a lot of trauma inside of him. And he's told me, I'm not ready to talk about it yet and release it. Is this pretty common in animals that have had gone through trauma that I'm, I'm just waiting him out and just I've had to build his trust because he really didn't trust people a whole lot and just build his trust back, is it common that they will come on their own time? And no, I don't feel I want to push him until he's ready. Okay. Well, first of all, Joyce, I want to honor you for honoring, what's your, what's your horse's name? His name is Bay. <laughs> Bay. Okay. For honoring Bay's individuality and his, his choices, his desires. So yes, just like people, we will become resistant if people try to force us to do things that we don't want to do if we're not ready for. And especially when it comes to trauma, I'm a hypnotherapist also. And so I work with people in releasing physical and emotional trauma. And if we're not ready to release something, and when I say we, I'm including animals in this, if we're not ready to release something, it's just not going to go. And Lydia, I'm sure that you can talk about this too with Reiki because I do energy medicine work also. If we're if you're not ready to release something, it's not going to happen. It's just not. And it's not in whoever the being is. It's not in their best interest to release at that time for whatever reason. When it's time, it's time. And sometimes there are lessons for say, you know, if Bay, there are lessons that he needs to learn before he's ready to release you know, what this is. And so for him, maybe trust is something that he needs to, to embody and to embody to a certain degree before he's able to release that. Because sometimes when we hold on to pain, there's something called secondary gains. And sometimes that means that, okay, if we have an issue or a trauma that we hold on to, there's something that we get as a benefit from it. For instance, you know, if someone is injured and they can't work, well, they get to sit around on their butt and watch TV while they collect disability for a little while. Maybe they might milk it a little bit because maybe they don't want to go back to work because they're getting secondary gains or attention that they might not have otherwise gotten. And not that I'm saying that he's doing that, but sometimes the trauma can actually bring something beneficial that we then have to look at and say, 
okay, can you still get that benefit, but maybe from a different behavior? So in Bay's case, it's probably, it sounds like without knowing you know, his whole story that he just needs to come more into trusting period, um, trusting you and trusting himself. And that's sometimes harder to do <laughs> than to trust other people because when you've been mishandled and treated roughly, and I'm sure there are a lot of us here who can speak to that themselves, I know I can, it's hard to trust yourself to be able to be open and to have that ability to just be yourself with someone else. And so he may be needing to grow into these areas before he can fully come into that with you so it may be about him also but what you're doing sounds perfect for me because you're not pressuring him and you're not trying to rush him and that's probably the worst thing that you could do so you're actually doing the best thing that you can do for him and for yourself and I just love you for that and he does too and he's grateful and that's helping him so much well thank you thank you because that's so a lot of my other horses have said he's just not there yet. He doesn't trust himself to release the life that he's always had. So he he doesn't know. It's almost like they're telling me he doesn't know how to come into a different life. So he's not ready to release it. So yeah, that's that's exactly what I've been hearing too. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, Don. You're welcome. You're welcome. Lydia, you're still muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was again phenomenal, and we could just do a whole uh, a whole masterclass on on that. About you know, animals are affected in the same way humans are. If they're constantly told they're worth nothing, um, they're no good, um, they're good for nothing. Um, my donkey and our new horse um, had those had those experiences and it's hard to receive love and embody um, a new relationship with self when there's an imprint you have an imprint of being worthless right uh so yes that's another that's another conversation so i think joy is joy back joy i have to see i'm a whoops mm -hmm. she's here i see her <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, Don, um, it's, it's just so interesting what you've been saying. Um, my horses are sort of pro professional healers <laughs> and uh, they, they are healing horses, you know, that, that do the work every day consciously uh, or, or I'm, they do it anyways, but I'm being conscious of it and uh, they have clients and, and things like that. And um, lately they they sort of didn't want to be close to people and uh and there had been a renter on my land who um brought some unpleasant energy and i think they were reacting to that um but you know um i wonder well i just wonder if that happens yeah oh absolutely like, okay yeah I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Did you want to continue? No. Okay. Uh, yes. And that's why I addressed, you know, one of the first things we do in the class is to clear our own energy. And that's the first part in any time you communicate with an animal um, to clear your energy. And so when they, when there are people who are around animals and their energy is not clear, you know, like your renter where they may carry some energy that's not comfortable or the highest vibe, then animals will shift. And here's here's a little quick overview of, of how that works. So I'm in a healing touch for animals practitioner and we're taught about the animal energy system. And so humans, you know, we have our chakras, animals do too. We have our layers. It looks like a cake layer. You know, we have our layers of energy field around us that are powered by our chakras. So comes in, it'll, it takes a while to come through all those layers, but animals, they have all those layers, but those layers have basically been chopped up, if you will, and they just revolve around them. 
in a field like static. And so all of their all of their layers are just everywhere all at once. So this is where they get their instinctual behavior from. And their energy field is about six times the size of a human's. So ours extends out our arms length, you know, from us and above us and below us. There's a six to 10 times the size of a human's. And so they feel a storm coming from far away because their energy field is so sensitive and they'll feel it from far away, just like it's right here. And so that's why they respond to things from further away. Whereas humans, because we've learned to live on top of each other and pull our energy fields in, we are idiots when it comes to sensing danger. It has to be on top of us. And we're like, whoa, there's Godzilla right there in my face because we don't have that same sensitivity in our energy fields. So that's why we need to have that clarity before we come to them because their fields are so sensitive. And that sounds like that's what's going on here. So what you might wanna do for your horses is, I don't know if you can do anything, you know, to they, they will avoid that area, you know, and that person they'll know enough to, but if you know anyone who can, or if you can yourself, just help them do some clearing uh, of their energy. And so that can help if anything gets on them, you know, like comes in that's negative, you can help clear that out. And one of the things that um, we were taught in Healing Touch for Animals, and it's super, you can do it with people and with animals, and it's really easy, is you just kind of take your, your fingers and you can do this, whether you're with them or whether you're not directly with them. You just imagine that they're right there with you, if they're not, and you just start like around their head area. And you just drag your fingers like you're raking right through their field and off their tail. And you're getting their energy field and you're clearing it. It's called magnetic clearing. And you do this until either 10 passes with a bigger animal, you might need more. You'll be able to tell whether intuitively or you'll feel physically, you'll be able to feel that their energy feels smoother. And they might need some clearing until this energy, you know, is further away from them. That renter is gone or, you know, it's just that might be part of a maintenance, you know, that you check in with them and see how they're doing. Was Thank that you. Yeah, that renter is gone and I, I, that renter is gone and I have cleared them. So, yeah, I think that's that's right. And that's really good information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it works for ourselves, too. We can do it on ourselves. You know, you can just start at your own head and just come down your body, go down to your feet and you just clear your field. And that helps you be clear as a person. And, you know, if you're around a group of people or whatever, where you're like, oh, gosh, it's, I don't really want that energy right now. You can just clear that off yourself. So, yeah, well, I'm glad the renter has gone <laughs> and hopefully things will be more, you know, comfortable and return more to, you know, normal for everybody. Wow, thank you. This is like a phenomenal conversation and such wisdom and, and tools you're sharing. Uh, Cami, do you have anything you wanted to ask? Well, actually, I've, I've already signed up for the newsletter. <laughs> uh, and um, I, pro I probably actually want to contact you. I've got a couple of dogs, one with health issues and another one that's injured and um really trying to navigate and i have one communicating with me right now and i don't know what she wants <laughs> um so i'll definitely reach out and um i'm probably going to need some help with those two <laughs> okay I mean, wonderful you can just go to my website and there's a thing that says schedule and you can okay. just go there and i give i give um a 30 minute complimentary consultation so we can talk about everybody and okay. what need and that's complimentary awesome. thank you so much yeah thank you okay anybody else julie's on the phone here julie do you have any questions or comments julie is still with us i don't know julie says it says julie's still with us maybe she's not i don't know Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask uh, Dawn any questions or share a story? Actually, Lydia, it's Teresa. Oh, Teresa. Can I just ask one oh. more little question sure. that I ask? I ask it with a heavy heart uh, because 
It has to do with um, animal slaughter. Uh, here in downtown Toronto, uh, I belong to an organization called Cow Save, which is part of the Animal Save Movement. Mm -hmm. And we... Lydia, you're muted, so I can't hear anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Teresa. Okay. Uh, Teresa sorry about that. Sorry, Teresa. Um, when, when did you guys not hear, Teresa? The last part was that she's part of Cow Save, which is part of Animal Save, and that was the last thing I heard. Okay, yeah, I forgot when I pressed oh. mute on my laptop. You can't, the phone doesn't okay. communicate. It's just, <laughs> sorry, Teresa, can you repeat that? I know it's okay. quite emotional, but. Yes. Okay, um, so we go to um, a slaughterhouse located downtown Toronto around Kiel and uh, St. Clair. And we do it like a silent protest. And we also, it's a vigil for the animals, for the cows that come in in these metal trucks from a farm. A lot of them have not had water, they had the cows, they had to stand, you know, sometimes for days. And they're brought to the slaughterhouse to obviously be slaughtered. And, you know, we're all animal lovers, we're there for the cows. And a group of us, we started um, praying, you know, for, these beautiful souls, because when you look at them through the holes in the metal uh, trucks, you know, where they're standing inside, like I've made some soulful connections. It's even hard for me to talk about it because a lot of times I cry when I'm there and so do a lot of other people. But I feel that soul connection of these beautiful cows and knowing that they're going to be brutally slaughtered and some of them know that too. They start uh, banging against the metal walls. You know, they sense it, that death is upon them. So, you know, I pray and a few other of, of the attendees pray and we send them lots of love. Can you, Don, give us, give me some suggestions of how else, you know, we can help these animals, um, you know, to, I guess, face, their fate, uh, you know, at the slaughterhouse. Um, like our, our, our prayers, and a lot of times you're just sending them good energy that they, you know, that their death is not painful. Like, how can you, what can you help? How can you, oh dear, it's so emotional. What can you say to help us to help these animals at that point in their lives? Right, well, First, Teresa, I want to thank you for doing what you do to do that, <laughs> carry that heavy burden uh, in your heart and physically, you know, when you're there to deal with that, that's huge and it would break a lot of people. So you are brave and you are strong and you're there for a reason for them. And so this is kind of the horses, um, sorry, <laughs> the cows, I have horses on my mind. The cows are actually telling me this. So as a, as a group, so this is just the soul of cow before the slaughter. That's what they want to be called. So it's the soul of cow before the slaughter. And what they're saying is that you being there with them, the group of people, all of your hearts are actually helpful to them just by being there. And there's not always something that we can do. We're called human beings for a reason, because we need to learn how to just be. And sometimes that's the hardest lesson for us. And so they are there to be and to face the difficulties of being slaughtered. To That's their gateway to go back home, the place where we all come from. So they know that that's what they're there for. And they know that what you and all of the hearts who are with you are there for is to make sure that they're not alone when they pass through that gate. 
and they want me to tell you that love is what they need. So that when you send love, it's kind of coming in fast. So I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding because when telepathy drops in, it doesn't have words and it's all like a package that you have to then unpack. So what they're saying is that when the number one thing that you can do is to give them love, to release anger, indignation, even if it's righteous, which it is, they want you just to feel love for them. Feel love for them, feel love for yourselves for being there. And here's why. Because when you're there praying for them, sending love to their hearts, you are helping to mitigate the fear and the discomfort of the situation. You're also opening that door and helping them feel that energy of home to come through from what's called the other side of the veil, even though there is no veil. So you're helping them to feel that energy of home before they're even there. And it makes that transition less painful because that compassion, that unconditional love that exists when they go home, you're able to bring that to them sooner and have them have an easier time of it. So just, just send love and compassion to them for yourself and for them. That's that's the number one thing that they want. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's healing for me to hear that and just to know that that they feel the love um, that we're sending them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for what you do. Whew, that's brave. And noble. Lydia, you're muted again. Sorry, I thought I back. Thank you, Teresa and Gone, for that. This this is reality. Um, what Teresa is discussing, and it's the bravest of souls, um, who who incarnate, um, to go through that, and of the humans who uh bear witness and support the the love the the soul of 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 those very high spiritual beings um who come to the earth to share their light to help raise the frequency of the planet and and yet are tortured and slaughtered um and as much as we want that to end immediately it will take some time on the planet so um, so thank you, Teresa. You're an incredibly powerful, uh, highly evolved uh, soul um, who is in oneness uh, with the universe, with life. You you are not living in separation. Uh, so uh, you are very powerful, and your the your um, actions and your love are extremely needed. Uh, to to support uh, the animals in the immediate now, but also in the evolution of of life on Earth. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Don. Oh, thank you, Teresa. Yeah, I um, my father was a meat inspector for the provincial government, and I I grew up in slaughterhouses. He used to take me to take your kid to work day or week. And that was, those were slaughterhouses. And so I know firsthand what happens. And then I won't get into it now, but I know what happens to someone who works in those facilities. My entire, my father's entire life on every aspect was destroyed. And he had a life of extreme suffering because um, he thought he needed a paycheck. Um, and it was, it's horrific that, so I, I've lived it. Um, I've been where Teresa is and I grew up, I grew up in slaughterhouses. Uh, so, um, that's part of my, uh, you know, journey on earth. Uh, but we, it's the strongest and the bravest of souls to face the truth and humans are evolving 
So we no longer want to live in denial. You know, we're, we're each high spiritual beings that have the strength to be able to face the truth and to make steps towards making the world a better place. We're not, we're not so disempowered, right? Um, as we have been thought or told. So um, anything else for Dawn uh, for, for, for today? It's been phenomenal, uh, Dawn. And uh, we're so grateful uh, that uh, you've joined us today and you'll have to join us again and uh, we'll have to do more beautiful work together. I would love to. I love your energy, Lydia, and everything you do. And I'm so grateful to be here. Wonderful. Martin. Oh, yeah, I just um, actually, Dawn and the other person, the previous person, um, she just left. Joyce? Joy, joy. Yeah. So I wanted to respond to the renter uh, because it's not only the energy of the human, it's also the energy of the house that maybe um, um, that, ha that has to be cleared as well. So it's not only, you know, the horse. It, it could also be the stall or the building that they are in or the animal that it, that is in the building that needs to be cleared as well. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because it's not only where you are, it's, it's the building that the buildings keep energy and furniture keeps energy. Uh, you know, I know I have a big tree here and it has a lot of energy and it gives back and you know give and receive but um anyway i thought I'd just mention that well thank you martin um dawn did you have anything to add to that about layers of energy clearing or you know there like there's sometimes a residue that's gotten attached and then we want to just complete that process yeah absolutely so martin I agree completely. I mean, it doesn't matter whether or not I do reality is reality, right? <laughs> but uh, one of the things that we learned in Healing Touch for Animals was to clear spaces. And uh, we we all leave our energy signatures behind. And so we can do that in you know, what we see as positive ways and what we see as negative ways. And I say what we see as because there's no good or bad. It's just what is. But the way that we feel and receive can feel good or not good to us. And so when we're in a place where there's been negative things happening or a negative being, that residue, you know, think Slimer from the Ghostbusters, you know, is left behind. So there are ways that we can clear. So we can go in with tuning forks. That's a really beautiful way to go in. And sometimes, you know, we just have something like that laying around where it's a tuning fork and you just you know, go through the space and you clear it. You can smudge, Martin, like what you did, you know, with the peace pole, you can just go in, smudge the area. And Lydia, if you want to jump in with any clearing techniques, you know, with Reiki that you use, if you clear your space, you know, or anything like that beforehand, crystals can be put down. Smoky quartz is a good one. Um, also clear crystal quartz is another good one for transmuting negative energy. And if anybody wants to jump in with clearing, <laughs> you know, um, you know, ways to clear essential oils, things like that, but uh, rose quartz and Himalayan sea salt. Exactly. Um, those are ways that we can clear our spaces as well. And land, land can be cleared. Parcels of land before you build a home on it, you can clear the land with those things too. Yeah. Wow. That's another, that's a whole other masterclass. <laughs> we have like five here that we have to put out there. <laughs> Actually, when I bought my property here, with the first one of the first things I did was have somebody come and do energy balancing with crystals and ge geomancy. Mm -hmm. And he, there's a major ley line of the earth that goes right through the guest side of the guest house and up through the center of the property. And and things do happen. When I first when I first came here, we were renovating one of the barns, and we had to put some uh, tents up for the horses. And I didn't know there was a ley line and I put it right, right, <laughs> ley line, right? Like, so we want to trust, we want to trust our, our instinct and our intuition um, because we're connecting 
uh, with something greater than our intellect, which is what this paradigm shift is all about. Um, so anything else? I think, uh, I don't know if you guys want to stay and uh, have Richard do a guide. I don't know. I didn't ask you, Richard, if you wanted to do a guided meditation for uh, the friends who are here, if Julie and Teresa want to participate on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And then I will channel Reiki to, to all of you uh uh when richard does his his guided meditation so we're ready to get started yeah we can do like five minutes or less here yeah about five minutes all right so i'll just get right. right so let's take a nice deep breath imagine oh. yourself in a beautiful place in perfect health in every way and that infinite river of gold and white light coming in healing every cell in your body. Richard? Yeah. So we're letting go as we breathe, letting go from becoming, letting go from this eternally moving time-space dance back into being, one being, one universal bliss, one universal presence, one universal peace, one universal reality, the substance before that substance turns into thought and emotion and the five senses and desires, the four elements. We let go. Let go and experience that which is already perfect, already healthy, already prosperous, self-sustaining, complete and whole. And the more we just rest in this vibration, and I know this from experience, the more we rest in this vibration, the more everything comes to us both from without as events and from within as guidance, as sensation, as contentment. And so as we get used to this vibration of wholeness, of that which is already complete, nothing to seek, we already have and already are it all, as we rest in that wholeness, everything comes to us. And it comes, and so that perfect guidance as that one perfection turns into a thought, a thought that comes from the source, a thought that is perfect, a thought that feels already complete. It's not a thought about how to get something. It's a thought to simply do one thing, a thought. And that's what allows that line, uh, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain, they build it. You know, that when we let love build the house of our destiny, mm -hmm. everything does itself. And being and becoming merge, the mother and the son, the infinite being as the mother, and the Tao, the, the unfolder of the 10,000 things as the son. Being and becoming merge, and we stay with that infinite place while we play in this time-space dance. And that's how heaven gets to earth, which is through us. Mm -hmm. And so we let ourselves express heaven. We let ourselves receive heaven. You know, a beautiful being came to visit me yesterday. And I, and I took in, you know, her wonderful soul. And I knew I wasn't totally there because I was busy reading politics when she showed up. <laughs> but it's like, we can let go of everything. We can do anything that's in tune with this perfection. And so we accept the perfection. We allow it to be our life itself, the life that is beyond form, that plays in form. And so we let ourselves surrender now. Let everything do itself. Let ourselves vibrate with who we really are, which is already perfect. And let that perfection take over our lives and give us everything that we've been striving to get to just vibrate let ourselves be the vibration, not a mind, not emotions, not a body. They're important. But to be that vibration of consciousness itself, of aliveness itself, formless, omnipresent, utter, infinite abundance. And rest in that so that our time-space dance can be eternally satisfying without grasping. And things can just unfold with the unity of all life, visible and invisible, already whole, already satisfied, already complete. This is who we are. This is our destiny. This is what the gift is. This is what this life is about. 
and we accept it and allow it and surrender it and let go in complete gratitude that this is always being offered. Take another deep breath. Oh. That was beautiful, Richard. I feel rejuvenated. Mm. <laughs> I can feel so much energy was coming through. I can feel my face flushed. Mm. Mm. You guys were absorbing so much. It was awesome. Um, so any any last, oh, let me just uh, finish. So thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to inviting Dawn back. Um, and again, the uh, what's your website, Dawn? It's dawnphoenix.org. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Dawn.